All right. The subject matter for the sermon this morning is going to be on the topic of having patience. And this is actually going to be a, a, a two-part sermon. I already know, while I was preparing for this sermon, there's so much information from Scripture on this subject that I'm, I'm going to have to cut this this morning, and we're going to complete it tonight. I already know this, so uh, be ready for that. There's a lot of information that we're going to be dealing with. Um, when it comes to this subject, you might think, oh, what's the big deal? I mean, patience, yeah, I know what patience is, what, you know, um, yeah, yeah, we should have patience. But patience is actually extremely important and critical to endure the Christian life. So, we, we, you know, our life is not just, um, you know, we, we don't have a shallow life in Christianity. If you're, if you're going to be following the Bible and following God's Word and doing the things you're supposed to be doing and living a life pleasing to the Lord, this isn't a sprint. It's not some, you know, we get just distracted with all the cares of this world until we die. There's, a, there's an end game. There's a goal. There's a, a purpose. There's a prize. We're running a race. And we need to make sure that we can maintain all the way through to the end. We want to endure. And obviously, I'm not talking about to receive our eternal salvation. We leave salvation by grace through faith. It's completely a free gift, already paid for. You receive it one time and you're saved. But we're talking about the way that we live our lives, to live a life acceptable in the eyes of the Lord, to receive rewards at the end of our life, to lay up treasures in heaven, to do all the things we're supposed to do. Hey, it's going to take a lot of patience. And there's many aspects of your life. This isn't just talking about patience of like not getting angry quickly. That's one aspect. We're going to get into that. But patience is, is multifaceted in our life and, and in the development that we need to endure and we need to um, hone and, and develop the patience that we have in our life. So in James, well, before I even get into James 1, I was told once a while back never to pray for patience. Because I had prayed for patience. I, I had prayed for patience once after I started going to church more regularly and getting sin out of my life. And, you know, and, and I realized I was, I was kind of hot-headed when I would drive. You know, you get the road rage going on and, and just, oh man, I, you know, get out of my way and do, you know, and all this and that and, and yelling at people and what, you know, just to myself because I'm in my own vehicle, right? And just getting frustrated and getting irritated and, and, and always wanting to get around. And I realized, you know what, what this serves no purpose for, for one. I mean, it's kind of like, what's the, what's the point of that? I'm getting all worked up over nothing. And I started to realize this is, this is, this is bad. Like, you, when you really start thinking about that, you're not esteeming others better than yourself at that point. You're saying, I'm important. You get out of my way. And this is what I'm doing. And that's wicked. That's not a right attitude to have at all. I mean, look, there's a lot of other people on the road. You ought to be courteous just like you would in, in, in everyday life. I mean, just as much as you shouldn't just be, you know, knocking people out of the way to get where you're going. It's the same way when you drive. It's the same way you try, you know, whatever you're doing. So this is, this was something that I was thinking, but I was, I've always had this just, you know, I, I hate not do, you know, like I want to be somewhere. I want to just teleport there and just be there because I've got stuff to do or whatever, right? Like, like I'm going from home. I'm going to work. I just want to be there already. I don't want to waste all this time in between of, of, you know, kind of nonsense of driving. I just want to be there. So there's always been this urge to just like get there fast. So I prayed that, that, that I'd get some patience because there's some things that you go through. Look, there is no way to teleport from home to work. You have this in-between time. You have to deal with it. It's something that you have to go through. And if you're going to go through it you know, at all, you're going to go through it patiently. Otherwise, it's, you know, it's going to tear you up and eat you up and, and cause you to have all this extra stress and you'll probably die sooner as a result. Or you just keep that type of, of mindset up. Seriously. I mean, it's funny, but, it, but, but that's the, I mean, it will eat you up and it's not good. And, and so I prayed for patience and, and guess what happened? I got in a car wreck and I broke my wrist and I had a cast on for a long time and my car was totaled so I was without a vehicle. We want to talk about learning patience, not having transportation, relying on other people, and you know what? Praise God for that. So when I told my friends at the time, see, I was still real young in the faith and stuff. And 
Oh, yeah, yeah, never pray for patience because God will answer that prayer and it's a big joke, right? And people make a mock out of it and kind of joke at it, but you know what? It's not a joke. Now, that didn't solve all of my problems with, with, with being, uh, you know, um, not being very patient in that situation. But it helped quite a bit. And I think to not pray for patience is bad advice. And we're going to see that from Scripture because patience is important. It's kind of like, you know, I pray for people who are not saved. If it's because they're lifted up in pride, if it's because they have all this money, I pray that God's going to take away all their money and that he brings them down really low. You might say, oh, why would you ever do that? Because in the long run, it's better for them. So if I'm asking God for more patience and it causes me to deal with some hardship and, and have to have some scarring for the rest of my life as a result, so be it if it's going to help me in the long run to be better, to be a better person, to, be, you know, to, to, a, to get victory over some sin in my life. Sometimes people need to be embarrassed tremendously over some secret sins that they have to finally just get that out of their life. It just needs to finally come to the surface and then it's fine, that's done gone and it hurts and it's painful and you don't like going through it and whatever but at the end of the day thank god that's over with and this is the way that that you know with me with patience we don't want to not pray for that we want to have patience now it may have to come about because of, because of the nature of patience you are going to have to endure things if you're not enduring something how are you going to learn to be patient with it it's the only way you're going to really achieve and get better at having patience is by going through the difficulty, going through the hardship to learn and experience that patience and to get through things knowing there's an end. See, and that's the thing. You, there's situations that are out of your control. There's no point in getting all upset about it. There's no point in getting aggravated about it. There's no point in getting angry about it. Have patience getting through it. Patience. Now, we're going to get into many aspects of this. As I said, James chapter 1, right at the beginning of the chapter, we look down at verse number 2. The Bible reads, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers' temptations. Now, it says, you know, divers is kind of like various or, you know, d different types of temptations. And that word temptations is not, when the Bible uses the word temptation, it's not always just talking about like being tempted with sin. A temptation is a trial. A temptation is a trying, you know, the Bible talks about um, your faith being tried or, or silver being tried in a furnace of iron. You know, there's, you got this hot furnace burning and it, and, it, and it melts off all the impurities. And then when it comes through, it's all pure and good. And it went through a trial. It, went, it, it was tried to, to eliminate all of, the, all of the dross. And this is the type of temptations that the, that the Bible is talking about here, that when things happen, look at verse number three, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. This is why we could count it all joy. When you go through hard times, when your faith is being tried, and think about what, what possible thing could happen for your faith to be tried. Faith in God. We're talking about serious events. Something that's going to shake you up a little bit and go, wow, I don't even, you know, like, how can God let this happen to me? That, that is a trial of your faith. That is something that's going to test how much do you really believe this book? How much do you really believe in God or whatever? Those are the moments that come up that are going to try your faith. It's serious stuff. This isn't just little things. In your, you know, it, it, this isn't just speeding in your car. Okay? Spe you know, get, getting a little upset while I was driving, wasn't trying my faith at all. It was a separate area where I needed patience in my life, but that has nothing to do with trying my faith. This is talking about, I mean, think about like the loss of someone really close to you. That would be something that might really try your faith. Losing a father, losing a son, losing a brother or sister. So, you know, someone who you really love, and especially if it's an extreme tragedy, they're younger, you know, how can this possibly happen? That is a trial of your faith. It might not be necessarily a loss. You have bad things happen to people. You know, I thought I was doing everything right. How could this happen? 
Job. Job was tried in his faith. He was doing things right and lost everything, lost loved ones, lost his money, lost his house, you know, and even had his wife turning against him, and all these things. It tried his faith. It's a trial. Now, those are not pleasant when you go through them, but the Bible's telling us, count it all joy when you fall into these temptations, and not because you're happy about the bad things happening to you, but what it's going to result in you. What it's, what it's going to work in you is the trying of your faith. The Bible says, worketh patience. It teaches you and instructs you to be patient in situations that you can't control, to be patient when these things happen, to not lose control, to not charge God falsely, to not start blaming everyone, but to be able to go through it, to endure. Job endured his hardship. Job endured the trying of his faith. But in everything that happened, what did he say? You know, the Lord hath given, the Lord taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. That was his response. His faith was tried and he came forth like gold. He came forth pure. He came forth good. And then as a result, after all of that trial, after everything that happened, God blessed him with double. God finally ended up just, just saying, you, you know, you came through these trials, these temptations, and endured with patience and received a blessing at the end. And that's kind of the way that our life works. See, we're gonna, we are going to go through trials and temptations in this life, no doubt about it. But how you deal with that, how you go through that, is going to determine the end result what God blesses you with, what God rewards you with at the end of your life as a result of how faithful you were, how when you're tried, how true is your faith to God. They're testings, and we should, we should look at this not as something that we want to avoid, not as something, you know, like I said, it's not pleasant going through it, but when you find yourself in the midst of the situation, there's a comfort that you can receive while you're going through the worst of times. While, while the, the worst things in your life are happening, take a mental note of James chapter 1 here. For when you go through that valley in your life and the temptations and trials, because normally when temptations and trials come, you're not even thinking that you're being tried. The, the thought doesn't even necessarily pop into your head, hey, I'm being tried right now. Because you're just kind of dealing with everything that, that popped up on you all of a sudden, blindsiding you. Within, like as in with the death of a loved one or something, usually those things happen just, wow, out of the blue. Where did this come from? Everything's going normal in your life and then, bam! We all face trials and temptations. But when those events happen... It would be wise, and, 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 and take note, try to, try to keep this in, in your mind, that you need to be able to get through this trial. While you're not happy at the specific circumstances, you can take comfort knowing that I'm going to get through this, I can get through this, I'm being tried, there's a trial going on, and... In the end, it's going to work more patience for me and I'm going to be closer to what God wants me to be like if I could just get through this and handle it appropriately. Verse number four says, But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So what that means there is, you know, when it says perfect, it's, it's, when it says perfect and entire, it means you're complete. There's the, the, the patience adds an aspect to you maybe that you didn't have before that, that you're more of a complete person and, and well-rounded in, 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 um, in your spirit and in your attitude and that you're wanting nothing or lacking nothing. Patience will help you in your contentment. 
being content with what you have, with what God has already blessed you with. Again, like Job, he had the patience of Job is exalted, right? Because he went through everything and he was content wherever God had him along the way in his life, whether he had all kinds of riches and blessings and children and big family and everything else, or whether he had nothing. The whole way through. Now, he, may, he was sad, obviously. We're, we're all going to have problems and... and, and, and <laughs> You know, have to deal with certain things. And Job, probably more than anybody, other than maybe Jesus Christ, you know, going through things that were undeserved or, you know, uh, and dealing with such loss. You're not expected to be happy going through everything and just, you know, about, you know where, where you're just like, how does is this not even affecting you? No, of course not. But in your soul, in your spirit, you've got you to maintain the patience and the hope knowing that I'm gonna get, I could get through this. God's not going to allow me to go through anything that I can't handle. And the Scripture promises that. That we, you will get through it. You can get through it. Turn if you go to Romans chapter 5. We look at a lot of scripture just dealing with patience and how important it is, and it's brought up multiple times. The first aspect of patience that we're dealing with is just the patience that you have when you go through trouble, when you go through trials, when you go through tribulation. There is a patience required during that time period in order to endure, in order to make it through the rough patch in your life. Romans chapter 5, verse number 3. Romans 5, verse 3, the Bible reads, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Again, a great passage besides James 1 is Romans 5. To write down, keep that in your mind. You, you know, when you go through different periods of your life, when you have different trials and tribulations and, and things you go through, Scripture can help you, can help comfort you, to help you to understand, to help you to, to just to, to make it through to have these words reiterated to you, and you can see the attitude that's being presented here. Glory in tribulations. It's not a bad thing. It, you know, we go through hard times, but in the end it's going to work out, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, so that whatever trials and troubles you go through, it will work patience in you, and that patience, it says, patience experience. Once you've already gone through something, so you, have to, you have to get the patience first because as you're going through it, this is happening and in, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. And I have to accept the reality. I have to accept the position that God's put me in right now and have that patience. And as you learn that patience, it builds the experience of going through that. So that way, the next time you go through a hard time, a hard, you know, some loss, something else in your life, the experience is extremely valuable. And especially a patient experience is going, you'll be able to remember and think back, I've been through extremely difficult times before. And I made it through. I had that experience that when everything seemed to be falling around me and that there seemed to be absolutely no hope in this world, I still came through. I have the experience of having done that. And here I am again. That experience then gives you hope. The first time you go through something, it may seem hopeless. But once you build that experience and you make it through, 
You come out the other, maybe you don't make it through the ideal way. Maybe you do make a lot of mistakes, but you, you learn the patience and you learn the experience to be able to, next time you have a severe problem, next time something bad's coming up, next time you're being tried, next time there's temptations. Here's what happened last time. I have an experience now to fall back on and say, okay, it actually wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Or, you know, here I am. I've made it through all of this. If I've made it through that, I could make it through this. And it provides more hope and it's going to help you to endure and to continue to endure. The Bible says in verse 5, there are Romans 5, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Once you have that hope, you know that God's not going to turn his back on you. You know that God's there for you. Hope maketh you not ashamed. Job wasn't ashamed to be called a son of God. Even though he was going through all that. Why? Because he knew in the end where he was going to be. He knew there was an end with God. He knew that he was going to shed this, this physical fleshly body that we have. And he was going to be giving a new glorious body in heaven. And this is something that he knew, and he was not ashamed. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. James 1 and Romans 5 both are talking about having joy when you fall into temptations, glory in tribulation. It's a good thing for you to be going through these things. It may not seem like it at the time, but it is because of the patience that works in you. Hebrews chapter 12 is going to show us we need to be patient in all of our afflictions. And especially when that is a result of our own sin. See, sometimes we find ourselves in problems that you didn't cause, that somebody else caused, right? There's nothing you can do about that. Well, sometimes you find yourself in problems because of your own sin, because of something that you chose to do. And when it gets to that point, there's still nothing you can do about it now you're being chastened. Now you're being chastised. Now you're dealing and reaping what you've sown. But you still need patience through that. Even if it's your own fault, obviously you ought to repent. Obviously you need to get right with God. But the, having the patience, whether it's your fault or not, you need to have the patience to endure the chastening, endure the temptations, endure whatever is going on in your life. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1. The Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So he's saying we need to lay aside every weight, everything that's burdening us and, and bagging us down and the sin that's going to come into our life and cause us problems and, and burden us. And let's just run this race with patience. Let's get rid of the weights. Let's get rid of the, the, the sin and be able to patiently plow through this life. Continue going forward. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross this is despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God Jesus Christ went through a lot and it's going to go into that a little bit more in the next few verses just into more detail what he suffered but don't forget it says here the reason why he endured this and he endured everything he did is for the joy that was set before him he endured. Jesus Christ took patiently everything that was dealt to him. The cards that he was dealt, the hand that he had to play in order to achieve, you know, the, the, to, to purchase the free gift for all of us. Because of the love he had for us, this is what he had to do. And you know what? He took it patiently. There's no other way around it. He did what needed to be done and he did it patiently. He endured the, the, the death, even the death of the cross. He endured the shame. He endured everything. And he took it patiently. He didn't lose control of himself. He didn't flip out and go nuts and go off the deep end. 
He took it patiently. And he did it for the joy that was set before him. He knew in order to get to that joyous point, you know, that peak, that pinnacle, there's a big valley in between them. And he had to go down into that valley and suffer the hard time and go through it patiently and then just keep trudging back up the other end and just keep putting one foot in front of the other one, keep putting one foot in front of the other one and getting through and going patiently with his eyes up at the peak, his eyes up on the top. And this is the way that we need to be going through our lives. Again, this, this sermon is for the hard times, the difficult times. You know, I pray that none of you are going through difficult, extremely challenging times right now in your life. But they're going to happen. It's going to come. And this is preparation for that time. Let's keep reading here. Let's look at some of the afflictions that Jesus Christ suffered and went through. Verse number 3 there, Hebrews 12. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. It's important to remember Jesus Christ so that you don't get so caught up in a poor me attitude of all this stuff happening to me. How could I possibly get through this and be weary and faint in your minds and just say, that's it. I can't do this anymore. Look at what Jesus went through. That's what this is saying. Look at what he... You know, Jesus endured a contradiction. Jesus Christ was not a sinner. He didn't deserve a shameful death to be hung up on a cross for his soul to go into hell for three days and three nights. He didn't deserve any of that. It's a contradiction. He was perfect. The Son of God. King of kings and Lord of lords. A contradiction of sinners against him. He endured it. He allowed it. He suffered it. Verse 4, it says, Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You're not fighting so hard in this Christian life. He says, you aren't resisting unto blood, striving against sin, fighting against sin. Jesus fought against sin and he won. He won that battle. He got the victory over sin and death and hell. But it cost everything. But he got the victory. And he did resist unto blood. And he fought that fight unto blood. He said, you're all still here. You haven't resisted unto blood. So don't be wearied and faint in your minds. Look at what Christ went through. Verse 5, And ye have forgotten, you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son, Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Now this is talking about you. Jesus Christ wasn't even a sinner. And he was striving against that sin. We are sinners. And he's saying, look, you've forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. You're a child of God. You have no reason to be fainting and getting weary when you have problems in your life, especially when it's because of your own sin, because God is chastening you. Don't be so weak in your faith to not be able to handle the, re the results and the reaping of what you've already sown. And the reason why you're being chastened by the Lord is because God loves you and he just needs to discipline you just as much as I love my children and, and chasten them and discipline them when they do wrong. Because I don't want them to keep doing wrong. I want them to do what's right. I love them so much, I'm willing to inflict some pain on their rear end and cause them to cry and not have, you know, and when they're really young, you know, they flip out and it's like the end of the world sometimes. It's, it's kind of, <laughs> it's humorous for us. Why? Because we're mature. Because we already have the patience. We've already endured. We already have the experience. We know it's not that big of a deal. But when they're that young, <laughs> to them it's like, what, yo, what is happening? And when they're really young, you don't even have to smack them very hard at all. Because obviously you're not talking about just abusing kids. You know, they're getting a, a discipline. 
And when they're really young, you don't need to do much. And when they're really young, they look at you like, like, I can't believe you just did that. Like, what? You, know, you, you shake their world completely. And everything's turned upside down. But then what happens as they grow? Oh, yeah, this is what happens. Okay, yep, I did it. Yep, I'm going to get my chastening. You know, my oldest daughter, when it's, time, when it's time when she does wrong and needs to be disciplined, she knows. She will come over, take it patiently. Does she still cry? Yeah, she still cries because it hurts. I mean, it's not joyous to be disciplined, but she's learned patience through it. And see, when God disciplines us, we shouldn't be all surprised about it. What, what are you doing, God? Look, you've, you're reaping what you've sown. We need to just to, to, to be able to love God for, for disciplining us and caring enough about us to not just leave us to our own devices and just go down the downward spiral into just the worst sin, you know, whatever. But he's loving us enough to, to, to steer us away from that. And we're not going to despise God when he chastens us or faint in our hearts when he rebukes us. Hey, you're wrong. The Bible says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards. And not sons. If you weren't being disciplined, if you weren't getting punished, if you weren't suffering through some things because of your own sin, then you have to wonder, am I even saved? Am I even a child of God? Because then it's like I'm a bastard and I don't even have a father there to discipline me and correct me when I'm doing wrong. But thank God we have a loving father. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 2. We saw in Hebrews 12 that we can look for comfort to Jesus Christ because of everything that he went through. He resisted on the blood. We haven't. And we also saw in Hebrews 12 that, look, oftentimes it's a result of your own sin. It's just chastisement coming to you. Whether you've done wrong or not, we need to still endure it patiently and be able to get through those rough times. 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to see a little bit more comfort and hope through Christ. Because the patience of Christ is our example in times of persecution or trouble. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse number 19, the Bible says, For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. See, when you do wrong, you are absolutely expected. You better take that patiently. You know what the Bible saying? You know, what? you would be completely in sin to not take it patiently when you are chastened for what you've done that's wrong. And you're not going to be rewarded for taking things patiently that you've brought on yourself. Of course you ought to take it patiently. What this is saying, though, is that when you do well and still you suffer and you're still persecuted and you're going through hard times and people are slandering you and you know, all this you know, persecution is coming against you, but you take it patiently and you have a godly attitude and you can still remain humble and you don't have to take vengeance on yourself and right every wrong, but you take it patiently and let everything run its course. The Bible says that is acceptable with God. That is the spirit that God wants us to have. We don't need to... to to correct every single person that's, you know, that, that wrongs us. We don't need to just always, you know, if I spent my time covering all the lies that people say, you know, I would have no time to do anything else. God doesn't want us distracted with that. It's that, you know, he says, look, just do what's right. 
just do good, endure it patiently. Yeah, people are going to lie about you. Yeah, people are going to persecute you. Yeah, people are going to try to bring you down and get you to stop doing the work, but just endure. Just go through it patiently, and the more patience you can exert, you know, patience is going to give you experience, experience is going to give you hope, to the point to where you don't even think about that stuff anymore. Because you've been tried, you've been tested, and you're coming through over and over again, and it makes you stronger, and it makes you better in the end. Verse number 21 says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin. This is the example. Jesus Christ, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. This is the example. When someone reviles you, who is doing good, I mean, look, it's, that's why it starts off saying that Jesus did no sin. Because there was no reason for him to be reviled. He didn't do anything to bring it on himself. You know, sometimes you may do something to cause people to revile you, and that's on you. But the example that we're to follow is Jesus Christ, who did no sin, did nothing wrong. Neither was guy. He was not deceiving people. He was not tricking people. He was preaching the truth. But when he was reviled, he didn't revile again. He didn't sink to their level. He didn't just feel like he had to do and hurt them the way that they were hurting him. He took it. He endured. He said, okay, it's not going to change what I'm doing, what other people do to me. When he was reviled, reviled, now again. When he suffered, he threatened not. Oh, you better not do that or else I'm going to... Didn't have to do that. Just took it but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. He committed himself to God. He's saying, look, God sees everything that's going on. I'm going to commit myself. The Lord will deal with it. God sees everything that's going on. He sees the way that I'm living. He sees that I'm righteous. He sees what I'm doing. And he sees the people attacking me. God, take care of that. You're the judge. You're going to judge righteously. I'm not going to take this on myself to deal with all this. I'm just going to endure it. And you know what? By you enduring patiently when people are, are completely coming against you, God sees that it's even, it's even more vengeance that will be placed on the people who are persecuted. Because if you take matters into your own hands, God's going to go, oh, well, he's already dealing with that. And now you're doing things not the way that God told you to do. And whatever punishment they might face is probably going to be less because you're getting involved. So just let God deal with it. And the more righteous you are, the, the, the worse their iniquity is. And God will deal with that. That's why when we, when we read on Wednesday night about your enemies, you know, give them food. Give them drink. For in so doing, you heap coals of fire on their head. Because when someone could continue to be mean to you, to, to bring you down, to, to, to persecute you when you're doing good unto them, that's way worse than, you know, even if you didn't do anything. But when you're actually going for, you are like, no, 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 I'm going to overcome evil with good and I'm going to do good to them. And then they still come down hard on you. God sees you like, well, that's, like, that's ridiculous. And you're heaping coals of fire on their head by, by, for them to continue to, to persecute you in that situation. So, Verse 24 it says, who his own self bear our sins and his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Jesus Christ is the example of someone who suffered for us and suffered wrongfully and suffered all forms of, of persecution, all forms of, of blasphemy and, and people lying about him, reviling, ridiculing, spitting on him, hitting him, nailing him to a cross, you know, bearing false witness against him. He took it all patiently. He didn't even have to, he didn't even defend himself, the pilot. Right. He endured it. He didn't have to start coming out, oh no, no, you understand. See, I did this. You don't need to do it. You don't need to make explanation. When you're right and you're doing what's right, you don't have to explain yourself to anybody. You just keep doing what's right. Turn if you would to Luke 21. Let 
It's important to learn the patience. Obviously, maybe you're not going through any trials or tribulations right now, but there are guaranteed trials and troubles to come. And this is, this is guaranteed. You know, the Bible says, first of all, you know, all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We're gonna, we are going to go through it if you're going to do what's right, if you're going to follow the Bible. But not just that, you know, there's going to be a period of tribulation for the saints. And if we're alive during this time of the great tribulation before Jesus comes back, we need to know how to endure that, how to get through that. We need to have patience. Look at Luke 21, verse number 12. Luke 21, verse 12. The Bible reads, But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers, for my name's sake. This is talking about the tribulation where, where the saints, the believers, are going to be arrested. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be you know, put into prison, being brought before kings and rulers. Why? For Jesus' sake. Because you're proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. You're a believer. That's why. That's why persecution is going to come during this time. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. This is going to be a good thing. It's going to be a testimony for you to endure these persecutions and to endure these tribulations. Verse 14, settle it therefore in your hearts. Get it settled. He's telling us in advance. And let's take heed to this warning in advance. Settle your hearts. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what you shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed, both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends. The people closest to you, your own family, your closest friends are going to betray you. This is what's going to happen during the tribulation so we don't have to be surprised wow i never thought that my own father would turn me into the government because i believe in jesus christ i never thought my you know whoever it is it says in some of you they shall shall they cause to be put to death verse 17 and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake but there shall not an hair of your head perish. That's the promise that God's giving you. Like, you're going to be hated of everybody, but you know what? Don't worry. There's not going to be a hair of your head that's going to perish. In your patience, verse 19, possess ye your souls. You want to talk about the importance of having patience during the tribulation? It says, in your patience, possess ye your souls. That's what's going to get you through. He gave us the hope. He gave us the, the what's going to happen so you're not taken off guard. He gave us the ability to have the patience when this comes that it's going to be so bad that even the people who, who seem to have been closest to you, even parents that have raised you up from a young child will be willing to cause you to be put to death for the name of Christ. And we need to maintain our faithfulness and steadfastness and patience you're not going to be able to change these events. It's out of your control. All you can do is continue to do what God has told us to do to begin with. To continue to live righteously. To continue to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. But you're going to need patience to be able to endure. To be able to get through that. So if you go to James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verse number 7. One more reference to the, to the end times, the tribulation. James 5, 7 says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, 
until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts. Your hearts ready, get them established, firm, grounded, settled. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. It's coming soon, it's, it's, it's close. Grudge not against one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So we see the example, this is saying, of the prophets who all have endured their own afflictions and own problems and own tribulations so that when the Lord comes, there's going to be a time of great tribulation. And he's saying, think about them. Think about Job. You've seen the end of the Lord. So when you're going through the hard times, remember the end. God is pitiful. God is merciful. Endure. Amen. Be patient and be happy to endure to the end. And keep that end focused in your mind. That's good. Right. And in your heart. You're settled on the end. So that the, the interim, the times in between, don't shake you and throw you off the path. Because, no, this is the end. This is the end of the matter. And I've already been warned there's going to be hard times to come. I have already know we're going to go through a hardship. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. We're going to shift gears a little bit. I'm going to try to get through this pretty quickly because I'm, I'm only on, well, I'm on page three of my notes. I got quite a few notes. So I already knew this was going to be a two-parter, so don't worry. I'm not going to keep us here for a few hours this morning. Um, but there's, there's kind of, I split it up into kind of two di pretty different sections regarding having patience. So I want to get through this. The, we, so far we've covered... You know, obviously the importance of having patience and, and the, portion, the, the importance of having patience through the difficult times in our life. The tribulations that we go through and the tribulation to come. That the patience is going to help us to get through that. But that's scratching the surface still of, of patience on a whole and all of the things that we need to be patient with. You know, I brought up the example of, of patience just while driving my car. Well, that's completely separate from the patience that I've just been going into detail about, about the rough times in our life. So let's go into, I'm going to bring up now some other instances in our lives. Other things where we do still need to have that patience and need to be able to endure and not get sidetracked from our faith and be shaken, but in regards to other events. So in Psalm 37, this is talking about having patience because of, as a result of other people who are evildoers. Don't let the evildoers shake your faith or your patience in God's justice. Right? Just like the scoffers in the last time are going to say, well, where is the coming of the Lord? No, where is his judgment? You know, because since the creation of the world, all things have, you know, continue as they are now. Well, where is he? Where is a God of justice and judgment? You know, and they'll mock at it. And it's easy for many people to look at wicked people and say, well, wait a minute. You know, I'm doing what's right. I'm really working hard. And nothing seems to be going right for me. They're doing everything wrong. And everything's great. They've got the mummy and popularity and everything's just fine for them. And you start to then question God. Well, God, are you going to judge or what? I thought you were a judge. How can you let this inequity continue? How can you let them continue this way? When you, you know, scream about it in your word of how wicked it is. Look at Psalm 37, verse number 1. The Bible says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Fret. So it means don't worry yourself. Don't, don't be so wrapped up in what other, you know, these evildoers are doing. It says, Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. Don't envy what they seem to have. Verse 2, for they shall soon 
be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. We're being reassured here. No, stay on the right path. No, keep doing what's right. Keep having the patience and continue on that right path. Don't be all worried about what the evildoers are doing and they're not getting their judgment or anything else. He says, you just stay doing what's right. Continue doing that. Verse 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. You see, don't be so worried about these people. You think you have to take it upon yourself now to go and do evil to someone else because their judgment's not coming the way that you think it should be coming from God. It's a great passage for us not to, to be so worried about them that, you know, uh, you know, wicked doers that we just have to just take it on ourselves to right the wrongs. And it may be hard to deal with sometimes, especially if people are, are you know, if things hit close to home, mm -hmm. of not wanting to take vengeance personally. But the Bible says, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not, you know, you don't have to be worried about this. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. God will do what he says he's going to do. Amen. And we need to patiently wait and endure for God to do what he said he's going to do. Just because you see these people and they seem to be, you know, they're extremely wicked, but everything's going to be going well for them. Don't worry about it because God said he's going to deal with it. And he will deal with it. And it's not on your timetable, it's on his. That's right. And that's why we need to be patient. You think that people are getting away with murder in many cases. And you know what? Right now, it seems like they are. But you know what? They're not. Nobody is getting away with murder. Nobody. Not because God is a righteous judge. And we don't even always know the end result of everything that happens. Anyways, God is the judge and he knows what's going on. And those people that seem to be getting away with murder for their whole lives, you know, oftentimes they end up burning in a fiery pit for eternity. There's no getting away with murder when you're being tortured and tormented forever. even if they live to be 100 years old on this earth. And in your fleshly mind, you think, wow, they're not being judged. The judgment's coming. You don't have to worry yourself about it. God will take care of it. You don't have to fret yourself about it. You don't need to, to let that shake your faith. Just you do what's right. You do it patiently. And just know the judgment's going to come for them. I'm going to keep doing what's right. So having patience because of other people, because of the wickedness you see in this world. We also use some patience. Turn if you would to um, turn if you would, uh, Romans 15. <clears throat> Man, I don't know if I want to get into all that. We're already going pretty long. No, go, go to Isaiah 28. I'm going to cut it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop a little bit earlier than I was planning on. I'm going to stop a little bit earlier than I was planning on, but that's okay. I think I'll be able to get through the rest of this stuff a little bit quicker tonight. Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28. I'm not going to get through all of the instances that require painters, but I mean, you'll be able to figure it out, obviously, anyways, and we're going to get through more of it tonight. But um, 
One, one area that could require some patience sometimes is even with soul winning, even when doing what's right. See, we said not to worry about when people are doing wicked, but also when you're doing right and things seem to be going well, you don't have to, to fret yourselves necessarily over the good things not happening the way that maybe you expect them to. We, could, we need patience in soul winning. Luke 8, 15, I'll just read this for you. The Bible says, uh, this is about the, the parable of the sower. It says, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. We're supposed to be going out there and sowing the seed, doing our part, sowing, watering, you know, bringing forth fruit. And if we're doing that, look, at the end of the day, God's going to have to give the increase. At the end of the day, the person's going to have to receive the word. You know, you could do as much, you know, you hone your skills, you do as much as you can to be the best sower that you could be, to be the best laborer you can be. You're getting to sit at you, know, you want to be the best vessel, meat for the master's use as you can be. And once you've done all that, which is never going to happen, but once you, once you, you can you continue on that path, you know, at the end of the day, it's still you have no control over the fruit that will end up happening. So we can't be discouraged. You know, I've gone through plenty of times in my life where I've gone months without getting somebody saved. But I kept going. You know, you, you don't want to get to the point where you just throw up your hands and just say, well, it just must not work then. Because there's been other months in my life where people are getting saved all the time. And it's just been really bountiful. And it's just like, hey, man, it's harvest time. And people are getting saved left and right. Praise God. But then other times, I mean, lately, we've been having a hard time getting people saved. We've been in harder neighborhoods. But that doesn't change. We need to have patience in preaching the gospel, knowing this is what we need to do. This is what God has commanded us to do. And this is what we're going to keep on doing. We're not going to skip out on soul winning. Oh, because that's a hard neighborhood. We're not just going to not go there because, oh, well, I want to go get someone saved. I don't want to go there. No, we're going to go and we're going to do it. We're going to do what the Lord commands us and we're going to do it with patience. And just get through it. And move on. They're going to hear the gospel because Jesus has commanded us to preach the gospel to them. And we're going to patiently go through it. Isaiah 28, the last, this is going to be the last point. You need to have patience in learning the Bible in getting knowledge, in gaining wisdom. It's exciting when you get saved and then especially you get in a good church. It's exciting. I remember the excitement that I had when I first got into a really good church, a Faithful Word Baptist church. I had been saved for years, but never did I step foot in a church where it was just like, I mean, wisdom and you know, things were just being explained so clearly and people had a spirit and a heart to serve God and to do you know and, and just it was alive man it's a, it's a church that's actually just just thriving as small as it was just just had that life had the spirit had the word of God and everything was being taught and and and, and exciting when you are really young spiritually just as with children, oftentimes, you want to be older than you are, right? I mean, look, kids, before, before you get to the you know, driving age, you, you, you want to be able to go out, you want to be able to do more, but you are where you are. Spiritually, you have to remember that also. You are where you are. Now look, you strive, you work, you, do, you, you read as much as you can, you listen to preaching, but there's still only so fast you can grow. And there's going to be some things that you're not going to understand. There's going to be some things that you just don't quite get. You're not going to have all of the answers. And we need to remember that and be patient in our discovery, in our learning, in what God opens up to our understanding. Because if you're not patient, the tendency might be to just do the quick thing, run to Google, run to the internet, and just, what's everyone saying about this? And then just come to a conclusion 
and open yourself up to all kinds of false doctrines and heresy. You know, I mean, who knows what you're reading when you're going online and doing that? Seriously, like, we, we, you know, we're seeking wisdom from God. We're seeking understanding from the Lord. Let's immerse ourselves in his word and allow him to reveal it to us in his time. You still get your teeth. Look, I don't know about you, but the internet isn't, I don't see it in the Bible. And just having random people be your teachers. It's not in the Bible. Now, there are teachers. There are people, instructors, and people to help you learn. But that's why God is, has organized church. That's what it's for. It's, it's not just to, to go out into the marketplace, just to find teachers from everywhere, from anywhere, from every house. You know, that's not the way he designed it. The teachers are in for learning are, are in the church. And specifically, more importantly even, is, is the Holy Spirit and you in God's word. Those are the avenues. So, the Bible says, you're in Isaiah 28, look at verse number 9. The Bible says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. So, if you're, a, if you're a spiritually a newborn because you just got saved, praise God that you're saved. Praise God that you are a child of God. But if you're an infant, you still need to receive the milk of the word you know, you still need to be fed like an infant does, and that's fine. But don't try to go from, you know, from not even knowing how to crawl to running a sprint. Just allow yourself to continue to learn patiently. You don't have to have all of the answers. But then once you're drawn from the breast, once you're weaned off the milk, then you're going to really start to understand the doctrine. Because that's what it's talking about here. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? You really start to get better understanding of this stuff after you get off of the milk. Now look, milk is still doctrines, but, but this is talking about deeper things, bigger, you know, more, more knowledge. But verse 10 says, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. This is how we learn. And depending on where you are spiritually, you can listen to a sermon, I mean, packed with all kinds of doctrine, packed with all kinds of meat and some milk and everything else. But if you're a babe, you're going to receive the milk from that. There's going to be a lot of other things you're not quite getting. And that's fine because you're going to build on your knowledge. You're going to build on the things that you know. It's going to come to you a little bit here, a little bit there. You're going to say, oh, wow, okay, I understand that now. Okay, yeah, I've been wondering about this for a couple of years. I don't know, you know, now God has opened it up to me. And you know what? That's just the way it works. That's the way that God works. That's the way the Holy Spirit works. And when you, and it's going to be working more when you use what God has given you, he's going to open up more to you right. than if you learn something and just don't do anything with it all. I know this what I should be doing this, but I'm not doing that at all. Don't expect God to open up and reveal more to you. But all that said, we need the patience to understand the learning process, to be content with where you're at, but continue to grow and do things appropriately, patiently, the right way, it takes a long time for that great cedar tree or that great oak tree to become this big, formidable, strong, you know, unmovable tree. It takes time. And if you liken your knowledge and your understanding of Scripture to, to that growth, it's going to take patience while it's growing, while the, you know, the seed sprouted, there's new life, great. But now let's let it grow. Let's, let's continue to water it and you know, receive the word. But don't try to become this great oak tree overnight. Allow for the growth. Be patient with it. And don't just, just start running off to every, you know, to have to have these answers immediately. If you don't get something, it's fine. You don't have to understand everything right now. 
allow for the growth. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this great teaching from your word. Dear Lord, there's so much on this subject. Dear God, I pray that you would please help us all to have patience. I I'm not going to listen to the, the bad advice I received, you know, years ago. When, uh, when I was told, oh yeah, never, never pray for patience. God, I do pray for prayer. I pray that, that we can all have more patience here, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to be more patient in, in, in all areas of our life. Dear Lord, that we can learn to do what we're supposed to be doing and to do it patiently, dear God, and know and have that, that knowledge and faith of the end result, that we won't be shaken in our faith, that no matter what hard times and trials and tribulations we go through, dear God, that we could remain faithful, that we could keep putting one foot in front of the other and keeping our minds and our hearts on the end and, and knowing that you're a long-suffering and merciful God and pitiful God, dear Lord, and that you will, um, and you're righteous and you're a righteous judge and you won't allow anything um, ultimately bad to happen at that, you know, and, and where the end result is uh, you're going to make us stronger as we go through our trials and tribulations. God, help us to keep this in memory and uh, that you would just continue to lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.